computer. It's recording. Okay, uh, comrades, I'm uh, with comrade Fabio from Brazil, and we are here to discuss about the second wave of the COVID pandemic that has hit India. As some of you would know from seeing the news, that this second wave has proven to be the deadliest spread of the virus so far. There have been about three. 150,000 new cases added on a daily basis for the last two or three days. Over a million cases in just a week. Crematoriums are overburdened. Hospitals are overburdened. The healthcare system and infrastructure is on the verge of collapse. Everywhere, we are seeing shortages of something as basic as oxygen supply. At the same time, almost for a month now, while the second wave was catching up. The Modi government, particularly the BJP and the ruling Trinamool Congress, the TMC party in West Bengal, as well as their corresponding uh, centers in states like Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, all states hit severely by the virus were organizing election mega rallies. There is a very clear and highly politicized link between the spread of the second wave and these election mega rallies, as well as uh, re religious gatherings like the Kumbh Mela in North India or the Ugadi festival in Southern India. The fact that this government let these mass gathering events happen, even when the virus was spreading and rapidly in that, was a very political decision. The BJP government has to be understood in context. It is a government of Hindutva supremacy. It will never curb religious gatherings, will never curb religious rituals from taking place. If anything, they might use that as a political ploy to attack the regional parties. Now, today in India, it is there is no uh, strong national party that can consider itself a leading opposition. The strongest opposition so far has come from West Bengal and other regional uh, centers of opposition. In Maharashtra, for instance, uh, epicenter of the pandemic in India, we have an opposition-led government in power, a coalition of Congress Party, the Shiv Sena, and the NCP, a breakaway faction from the Congress Party. The central government, which is responsible for the supply and distribution of oxygen throughout the country. There are numerous supply chains emanating from, from the central government. And in terms of vaccine distribution, which again is controlled to a great extent by the central government, has been discriminating against states which voted against the BJP. You have a combination then of vaccine distribution vaccine discrimination of a terrible healthcare infrastructure, a glut in the supply of basic necessities like oxygen, an overburdening of hospital infrastructure, which was already quite weak in India, and a environment which allowed for mass gatherings and super spreader events like election mega rallies and Kumbh Mela and religious festivals. A combination of all of these factors have come together to create a crisis that was, by all accounts, completely avoidable. Consider this till about the end of February, right about before the election campaigns began in earnest. The cases of coronavirus were declining. First wave was actually seen, at least from the numbers, that it had been won. It hit a low of almost 8,000 cases a day, with recoveries being double that of new cases. From there, we reached 350,000 cases between uh, March and the end of April. So in just two months, all the gains that we had against the 
pandemic has been reversed and more so. One can make many conclusions from this. Not only that the BJP government's handling was terrible, which it was, and it still is, but successive governments failed to build up India's healthcare infrastructure to meet a challenge like this. And the BJP government is no exception to this. If you check the budgeted allocation for the health ministry, it comes below the transportation ministry. So the priorities are quite clear. Healthcare is not a priority. India has one of the least, uh, I'd say the worst, healthcare to GDP ratio in the world. And one of the most privatized healthcare systems. We have a, a system that is extremely decentralized and diffused, which has allowed to merge. We have private hospitals which overcharge. We have public hospitals whose uh, infrastructure is suffering from lack of funding, from lack of attention. And Quality of healthcare varies from moderate to terrible. In a state like Uttar Pradesh, for instance, a recent case has emerged of a couple having to drive 850 kilometers from the city of Allahabad, which is in North India, to the state of West Bengal in East India, my home state, in fact, to get the treatment because she could because they could not find a single hospital with enough oxygen supply. And to top it off, this government, facing so much criticism from home and abroad, it's this failure being impossible to hide, they have resorted to trying to clamp down on people even talking about oxygen cylinder shortages. There is an ongoing campaign of censorship and intimidation across northern India, especially in, state, in states like Uttar Pradesh and Delhi. In Delhi, the police has been reportedly harassing people who have been sharing details of where oxygen supplies are available. In the state of Uttar Pradesh, the chief minister, Yogi Adityanath, was a very extreme version of Narendra Modi, if you can imagine that, has gone on record saying that they would seize the property of those people who are uh, reporting against the government stating that there is a shortage of oxygen. He has claimed that there is no shortage of oxygen in the state. Now, let's say there is a kernel of truth to this because India produces more oxygen than the actual demand. The problem, you see, is in the distribution. Recently, the chief minister of Delhi went on to record, it was a live telecast event. He exposed the problems that his state was facing. There were numerous states bordering Delhi, which was actually stopping the supply of oxygen from coming in. A similar case, though not of oxygen, I believe, is in the state of Maharashtra, where a scam was unfolded, where the state BJP leadership, Devendra Fadnavis, was discovered with uh, numerous supplies of oxygen. I'll just confirm this. Point being, we have a situation where it is the infrastructure of distribution that has led to artificially created crises. From this crisis, we have a situation where black marketeering and profiteering has boomed. As if the situation wasn't bad enough already, the censorship, the artificially created shortages, that existing infrastructure has compounded to create a situation where people simply die without treatment. It is not that India does not produce enough vaccines. It is not that India doesn't have the money. The money is there. They just don't want to spend it. They don't want to marshal it. In fact, even the free vaccination program has come under question. India, which is a country that eradicated polio and its vaccination program was lauded internationally, this country 
is now charging for the vaccine and at exorbitant rates. So clearly the profits of the pharmaceutical companies have more priority over the lives of the people. But what is our greatest priority of the government is taking power in the state of West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and attempting to do so in Kerala. They will not succeed in Kerala as they have absolutely no infrastructure or any foothold over there. West Bengal is their greatest prize, and it is quite clear that the government is willing to let Indians die by the thousands in order for them to take power. This is the situation that we have in India today over the pandemic. During the last, uh, the first wave of the pandemic, which began around February end of 2020, the government delayed in handling it. There were also super spreader events back then also, namely the uh, visit of President Trump, 200 or so people had gathered over there. No questions were asked about that. A scapegoat was made over the gathering at the markas of a certain Muslim sect in Delhi. The, the Tablighi Jamaat the markas, in fact. Other gatherings organized by the ruling party, like the Trump event, they were ignored. From all these gatherings, the lackadaisical attitude the government took, the ignorance of the government, we had the first wave and then a haphazard lockdown. Now the lockdown, at one point, it was killing more people than the virus, if you can imagine that. We had an exodus of migrant workers who were not given any time for preparation, who were not given any kind of compensation for the loss of their jobs. Suddenly, they were deprived from their income and worse still, no transportation was provided. So trains were stopped, buses were stopped, people simply sat, starved, some died, some committed suicide, and some attempted to walk back home over thousands of kilometers from states like Maharashtra and Punjab to Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. The government did not maintain any statistics over the number of people who had died, but one NGO reported that about 1,100 people had died from this, and even that is quite likely an underestimate because they had very limited resources to uh, study, study this crisis. It was only after workers went on riot in places like Surat and Ahmedabad, the government suddenly woke up and decided a phase unlocking would start, and we would return back to some semblance of normalcy. Now that handling of the crisis at that time, it showed exactly what to expect from the government when the second wave hit. We had some of the same uh, tendencies. We had a government that had no prior planning. There was no sensitivity to the needs of the people. Infrastructure was involved and no manner of compensation was planned for those who would be affected by their sudden and haphazard plan. When the lockdown was lifted, every doctor, every scientist presumed correctly that there would be a ballooning of cases in India. In a very short period of time between say around uh, April of 2020 till September of 2020, India became one of the worst affected countries in the world. Till April, India was actually containing the rise quite effectively because of the lockdown. But again, the lockdown took more lives than it saved, according to some sources. That first wave was contained eventually by November that year. Cases continued to decline till the end of February. The government actually did manage to step up its uh, efforts at containment. Hospitals were being supplied. Healthcare workers were being equipped and 
people were starting to take the virus seriously. Once it declined, there was a era of triumphalism that we have already won over the virus. And this was even when there were 8,000 to 9,000 cases coming up daily. This was the uttering of the first wave. From there, we had the second wave emerge. It started in Maharashtra and Kerala, and then it spread to the rest of the country. And here we are today, a government that has had no preparation, that has mishandled the crisis from the first day, and which is more than willing to waste the lives of the people for their quest for power. It must be understood why this is so important for the BJP. You see, they have an absolute majority in the parliament so far, but they, uh, they don't have an absolute majority of the number of states under their rule. Under their rule. They rule Uttar Pradesh, I believe they have Haryana, they have Bihar through an alliance, they have all of the northeastern states, all seven northeastern states now. They have an ally in Tamil Nadu. BJP's own power is extremely weak over there. And they have Karnataka, but that hold is quite precarious. And of course, they have Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh. So that makes about eight, sorry, 15 states in total. And eight of which are about major states, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Tamil Nadu, and Madhya Pradesh. Yeah, that's about five major states. West Bengal accounts for about 9% of the total number of seats in the parliament. And this extremely vital state has been a passion of opposition against the central government. Since the days of the Congress, since really the start of, since the days of independence. In fact. If the BJP can take West Bengal, it sends out a signal to the rest of the regional oppositional parties. Get in line, join our side, or we will crush you. West Bengal is the biggest barrier to absolute power that the BJP is facing. If they take West Bengal, then the entire Gangetic plain from Uttar Pradesh to West Bengal and connecting into Northeastern India, this huge stretch will be completely under their control. Add to this Madhya Pradesh and pliant state like Odisha, they would be unshakable in their dominance over the country. And the path would be open for them, perhaps to take out a majority of the states of the country, even if some oppositional bastions like Kerala or Maharashtra remain, they could perhaps even push for constitutional amendments, which requires a special majority. And if that happens, then Heaven knows how far they may go with that. The BJP and its mother organization, the RSS, they have made no secret of their desire for a Hindu Rashtra. They have really made no secret of their desire and their attitude towards minorities, especially Muslims. It is quite probable that if they do take Bengal, and from there, if they are able to exercise their power over the rest of northern India, at least, it's quite possible that they may even change the constitution. This would be the first step, the stepping stone of a wider, much worse reactionary change. And unfortunately, the only force that stands in their way today in West Bengal is the Trinamool Party, a party that has also been known for corruption, for gangsterism, for organized violence, and revolves around a cult of personality around the Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee. 
in some ways, actually, Mamata Banerjee's initial rule in the state, it uh, provided a glimpse into what to expect from Narendra Modi in the rest of the country. So we have one reactionary party fighting against another reactionary party and leaving people's lives to waste in this world. So, that being said, we have to think of ways in which we can challenge this. And there are no shortcuts, unfortunately. In the short run, things will look bleak. In the long run, what we are seeing in the example of the farmers' protests, and before that in the protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act, there is still a potential to mobilize and organize the masses in the country. There is still a potential to organize and agitate with the working class at its core. This requires a new party, one that would be committed to this kind of work. The CPI, unfortunately, is not good. The CPI has lost its way. It has sold out to the forces of capitalism. It did so from 2006. It's really no surprise to anyone who has lived through their rule. Even though their example in Kerala is somewhat shining, I would say, did handle the pandemic well. Even there, the fact that they lost control over the crisis, and Kerala today is actually one of the worst affected states in the country, shows that there are still shortcomings even among the best state. What we do need is a new party, a new beginning, a revolutionary party, which in the bare minimum would call for the nationalization of the healthcare sector. So I'm open to questions. Tiraj, I think the you addressed the main main issues, and um, I think that's that's okay because you you raised the the enormous crisis around the pandemic and also the political crisis that is emerging uh, from it and the necessity of uh, a revolutionary party. Um, I just ask you to, to make something clear. When you mention the elections, you talk about the BGP, but we also have the Congress. In West Bengal, we, we have the um, uh, TMC, uh, and we have both uh, the CPI and CPM. These are major parties but no one of them offer an alternative for working people. Is that like this? It is true, in fact. See, the CPIM used to be a hegemonic party in West Bengal, who could not puncture their hold on power. That created a whole institution of party cadre linked with trade unions, linked with sections of the landowning bourgeoisie they had created a whole institution of power which has collapsed and since its collapse and in fact the deaths of many of its prominent leaders the party has completely lost about what to do new people are completely disillusioned with the cpim ever since it started going towards the neoliberal route the other smaller stalinist parties like the cpn the SUCI, the SUCI is an exception, I'll explain later. The other parties in the left front, which rule, it's not just the CPM, but CPM in alliance with other such parties. Once the CPIM lost its will, the, their allies could not fill the void either. So yeah, today we have a situation where people have completely lost faith in the CPIM. Even their own cadre actually have lost faith in the CPIM. The turning point, I would say, 
not just the 2016 state elections in which they played very poorly. That's emphasis on very poorly. The 2018 Panchayat elections, where many of their cadres were attacked, denied from even filing their nomination papers, some were kidnapped and reportedly still are being held by the TMC party cadres and their blind gangsters. This created a situation where even tried and tested CPIM supporters felt that the party will not look out for us. The party is lost. Let us vote for the BJP. At least we can get rid of the DMC. This was the mentality in which many former CPIM supporters did. There is an air of complete fatalism and defeatism. I'll tell you a personal experience. I went to the labor court. I do cases over there sometimes. And there, a lawyer handling a different case. She is a supporter of the CPIM. The judge asked her, do you have any uh, hope of winning? Because the CPIM doesn't show any signs of winning. CPIM supporter says, yes, I know we will lose, but I'm going to lose with them. This is not an exception. This shows the mentality of many CPIM supporters today and the state of the party. The party has thrown Thank you.